So we have our set of construction documents, our contract documents package. It's gone through the whole bidding process. We have our general contractor now. And now we've just said, well, okay, there's gonna be a bunch of changes that happen. Well, like, why? Why are those changes going to happen? Why can't we just make sure that we get it right from the beginning? Well, the answer is there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of different ways that things can change on a construction site. And that can go all the way from just straight pricing changes. Maybe the economy has somehow changed. I mentioned in some previous lectures that I've worked on projects where all of a sudden, for one reason or another, plywood just doubled in price, or concrete suddenly got much more expensive. Uh, or there was a change in the law about uh, how to deal with uh, landfill issues, and therefore demo got very expensive. Now, some of those kinds of issues, you could say, well, that's really an issue for the GC. It's that you know just, they made a bid, and that bid was a moment in time, and that's really their problem. But it depends on how the contract's worded, and it depends on how outlandish a change it actually is, and it depends on whether it made sense. Like, would you be able to have predicted this problem? And if the answer is no, you really couldn't have predicted the problem, well, then it really depends on the specific wording in the contract. But probably you're going to allow a change order that's going to let them raise the price if something is totally wacky and, and out of control in, in price that wasn't expected. It's not really reasonable to assume that uh, the general contractor is in control of the economy and can control the price of uh, plywood or something like that. Now, that doesn't mean just because they made a bad guess and their bad guess, they're trying to find a way to fill in the gaps. Right, so they would have to actually kind of prove that it really was an outlandish uh, price for the plywood and that it really was unexpected. Um, but that kind of issue can show up and just change things. So that might change. You might go to a different material. You might go from plywood to OSB. Suddenly now you have to change the contract documents in order to show that. Or you might go from a raft foundation to a micropile foundation or something like that uh, because of the cost of the materials. Like these are things that just come up through the process and you have to deal with them. And the fact that you're dealing with them means that you're uh, keeping track of them. You're making sure that they are not affecting other issues. Uh, if they are affecting other issues, you're making sure that the coordination of those changes is getting through to all the people that need to know about those changes, whether they be the consultants or the general contractor and his subs. So there's a whole series of roles that you're playing uh, even though this process is not really your issue. The issue is the general contractor, the price suddenly got high, and yet you have to be part of the team that makes all of this clear and understandable and reasonable for everybody. So depending on the contract and depending on what the actual changes really were, it would depend on whether that was something that the contractor was just stuck with or whether that would be a change order that would be a reasonable one for the client to just uh, lift the price uh, up. Other kinds of issues might be weather. It's not reasonable for the contractor or the architect to be responsible for a tornado or for just a heavy windstorm. Now that doesn't mean they shouldn't be responsible for sort of a general level of safety. The general contractor should be able to make a job site that is reasonably safe, but really nothing is reasonably safe in a tornado uh, or a big flood or something like that. Those are beyond the normal expectations. So there might be a whole series of questions about how the insurance companies will deal with it. And you might have an insurance company battle between the GC's insurance and the owner's insurance. But the general expectation is that the GC would not be responsible for the weather. Now, they would be responsible for normal weather patterns. So you shouldn't have material that's going to get damaged out in the rain sitting out in the rain. You shouldn't be putting large panels up that aren't braced back in some way so that if you get a reasonably large wind that it wouldn't just knock the whole thing right over and be very dangerous. But in that case, we're talking about a normal level of high wind. Uh, in that kind of situation, the contractor should be building it in such a way that that's not going to happen. So changes that come from the weather, there's always going to be that kind of question. What was a reasonable set of assumptions that the architect and the general contractor would have made about the weather in this process? And is it responsible, is it reasonable uh, to assume that the general contractor could have known about all of those different issues? So one quick example of weather is maybe you make a deal, uh, it's gonna be a six month construction and we're ready to roll forward and it's March and everything's perfect and we're gonna go 
and then there's some issue that comes up. Maybe it's a financial issue, maybe it's a code-related issue with an inspector who wants something to get fixed first, and the project gets delayed a number of months. And so now, all right, instead of starting in March, now we're starting in, say, November or December. Well, the issues of the weather that were going to be happening over the spring and summer for that six-month uh, project duration might be very different than the ones that are going to be happening over the six months starting in uh, November, December, and January, and et cetera, that it would be totally reasonable uh, in that moment for the general contractor to say, you know, look, the weather is different now. Uh, my bid, my contract with you was if we were starting in March, this is now a different project. The weather will have impact on our process and we can't just assume that we could just take that exact same bid and just shift it down six months later because the weather is now different. And therefore you might do all sorts of different changes into the concrete mix or into any number of different aspects uh, of the design process. Another reason that changes happen, which we've talked about a little bit already, is the idea that just clients change their mind especially once a contractor has started to actually build something out, you actually see it very differently when you actually see real walls and real uh, spatial relationships. It's very abstract for most people to look at a sheet of paper or look on a computer screen and truly understand what the relationships are going to be like. But once they can actually sort of stand in the space, uh, there may be changes that just come up because they realize there are differences in the way that they want to move forward. Or it could be that they realize, you know, uh, when we started this process, we thought we were going to get that big inheritance. Turns out we're not going to, so we need to scale it down. That's reasonable. That's okay for them to want to change the project, uh, even during the construction phase. As long as they do it in a way that fits in with the various contracts and follows the ways that people should be paid for those contracts, uh, and also allows the architect to make sure that whatever changes is being made still will meet the code compliance issues and won't create a situation that creates a problem for the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So there's all sorts of reasons why the clients might want to change things. And another one is just the idea that there's new information. Something new has happened. There's some new piece of information uh, that is telling us that we would be better off doing something different. Like maybe we were aiming towards condos and then suddenly all the uh, economic reports came out and it turns out condos are last year's news and apartments are rental apartments are all the rage now. So okay, maybe we make a bunch of changes because we have now have new information, right? That's reasonable. You can't expect somebody to not make changes when they find out new information. So what would happen? How do you make that uh, fit into the situation? How does the contract allow you to make those changes? What drawings are needed in order to explain those changes? Who needs to have those changes explained to them? So that would all be part of the discussion of figuring out how to make all of that work. Another issue that comes up all the time is that you have somebody else walks into the site and they have a different code interpretation than you did. Uh, an inspector says, uh, look, I, I know what you were trying to do here, but that's just not how we read the code in this situation. I've had situations where I've had exhaust pipes going straight out from the building and shooting towards the property line, and the inspectors came along and said, nope, can't do it, the property line's too close. Even though it, the way we read it, it wasn't too close, but the way they read it, it was too close. So we had to do a whole thing where we bend it around and had it shoot a different direction. Uh, we had some change that happened. In certain situations, relatively easy. Sometimes, though, it's pretty complicated. It's very easy to have a different set of interpretations of such a big, wide range of code issues. So it happens all the time that local inspectors will walk through. Even if you've got a permit already, local inspectors still will have that last say. Now, it doesn't mean you can't argue with them and challenge their way of interpreting the information. There's probably some process to challenge it, but they have a say in that. So often changes will happen and it's just because an inspector has a different code interpretation. And then also, there's all sorts of moments where you get these sort of found moments, these found things. They start doing the excavation, and the excavation uh, finds an oil tank or finds that there was something unusual down below. And so in those situations, the changes have to be uh, dealt with. You have to make sure that the changes don't compromise the code interpretations and that everybody who needs to know about those changes understands what the issues are. And sometimes those are simple things, and sometimes they're very complicated. 
For example, one time I was doing a project, a new garage. Uh, the garage was in a place where there was, had been an old garage that was built a couple of years earlier. It was cracking pretty majorly. Something had gone wrong. So they demoed that old garage because they were worried it was going to fall down. We designed a new garage. We did a soil test uh, in one location and then uh, moved forward with the project. And as they started to do the excavation, they found out there, in fact, had been a basement below where that garage was. That was why it had started to crack and fall in. That when they started to do the excavation, they just came across this old basement that nobody knew about. It was from probably 100 years before. And it actually stretched across various property lines. So we were having a problem, so were the people next door. So were the people next door to them because it was the same problem that nobody had foreseen. That would be an example of a found moment. You just can't expect everything and certain issues are just gonna come up uh, in the moment of construction and you have to deal with them.